Thank you. Thank you very much for tuning in. You know, today I wanted to talk about the importance of education. Many people have formal education and then they stop educating themselves. They think that they've kind of come across this finish line and there's no more need to educate. And you know, with the today with the world advancing so rapidly, with technology advancing so rapidly, our education has to keep up with us and has to constantly change or we could actually be left uh, behind in our businesses. We're going to talk to very successful entrepreneurs today that are at the cutting edge of this education. They're going to show us how to increase our bottom lines in our business. They're going to show us how to maximize our profits. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming back with us. I'm sitting here also with entrepreneur Steve Ames. Steve Ames, uh, I met recently, several months back, and uh, you know, Steve is a very successful entrepreneur and author, and he's, he's really a real estate mogul. What I thought was interesting about his story is he, I, I hope I can say this, Steve, but you literally scavenged your way to wealth. You came from very humble beginnings, right? Yes. And uh, how many kids were in the family? Um, well, there were eight of us all together. My dad was married before and had a, a son and a daughter. And so uh, I was the next to the youngest out of uh, six of his second family. Okay, so total of 11. Uh, well, eight, and then my oh. parents still would be 10. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, and we're, when we say mm. humble beginnings, we're not talking mm. about, uh, mm. you know, we could only get mm. limited toys for Christmas or something. We're talking mm. about humble mm. beginnings. In fact, I found a picture here. <laughs> If you would tell us a little bit about this picture. Uh, is this you here? No, that's my brother. Uh -huh. um, this is in 1954, by the way, and I was born in 1950, so um, this is me, and then uh, that's my brother, and then uh, three sisters, and my mother. Well, you'd and think they'd ha be able to afford a ha haircut. You got some long hair there. That's awesome. <laughs> But uh, yeah. we're talking yeah. really yeah. humble beginnings. I noticed yeah. no shoes. No shoes. We, uh, uh, the whole summer long, <coughs> none of us wore shoes. Wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I, I, I've had a chance to uh, meet your sister a little bit, Joanne. Yeah. Amazing gal. And she's also yeah. told me some of the stories. Yeah. So you literally, yeah. uh, you know, we, we talk a lot of times about business and cash yeah. infusion. A lot of people are looking for a certain amount of capital. I've talked to a lot of big corporations yeah. where they say, you know, all I need is $100 million. I don't need a lot of capital. I just need mm. 25 mil. And I'm like, what? But, you know, honestly, uh, there's a lot of speculation right now in the media as far as do is the United States a country where somebody can still have a great idea and on very limited means or maybe let's say no financial capital, let's say sweat equity, can we still take a great idea and, and create an opportunity in this country uh, without a lot of capital? And, you know, based on your story and many others, I would have to say that the answer is yes. You actually started out, I mean, uh, g getting like used nails and two by fours and old carpet and said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be this real estate guy, uh, you know, this yeah. investor. And now you have an empire I have, uh, between 600 and 700 uh, units. And um, yeah, I started I tell people I started out uh, buying shacks on a shoestring. Um, just for uh, maybe 5% down on a, maybe a private contract with the owner and just a little by little um, uh, scavenged the materials from yard sales and uh, re remodeled and uh, just, just on pennies built equity and then I'd, uh, I'd transfer that equity, I'd go to the bank, I'd, I'd ask for an appraisal a year later or six months later or a year and a half later and pull 20,000 or 25,000 or 15,000, sometimes only five or 10,000 out of that house and retain that house but transfer the equity to another purchase. And then two or three years later, I'd find myself with three or four or five properties. And then I was able to buy a, a, like a 30 unit or a 50 unit apartment complex just in a relatively short period of time by uh, transferring equity or, or what we call cross collateralizing. Yeah, and you know what I appreciate about your story, Steve, mm -hmm. is uh, there's a lot of people out there and they'll mm. go out, they'll get a mortgage on a mm. thing and then mm. they'll rent the property or mm. they'll whatever. Mm. And, and they, yes, th there's a lot of income coming in, mm -hmm. but the amount going out and versus and, and the amount left over versus mm. risk, it's not yeah. the greatest situation, even yeah. though technically on paper, mm. they make a lot of money. And with yeah. you, 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 you mm. kind of have a different approach to these things. I know you're very goal oriented. We yeah. were talking earlier about, and I, I believe you too, every mm. goal he's ever said, he says, you know, here's what I'm going to do. 
and then he'll just keep working at working at it. He might be late, but he never ever stops until what he said he's going to do, uh, he accomplishes. And I know one of those goals was to actually have your properties debt free. Right. Is that right? I um, started buying, <coughs> and I, I bought um, about four properties. Uh, I, I started buying when I was 26, and by the time I was about 29, I had four properties bought. And I waited about 10 more years. My kids were small, and we raised them up, and. Um, I didn't really, uh, I, would, I knew what I wanted to do, but my wife at the time was saying, well, you know, I think you should keep on doing what you're doing and not get involved in real estate. And sure. my heart was telling me that I really needed to be in real estate. So roughly 10 years later, I started buying again. And it took me about 20 years to put the, the whole fortune together. Yeah. But and, you know, starting out, uh, again, you started with sweat equity, we could yes, say. Yes, I did. And uh, you, you've got this empire between six and 700 units now. Yeah. And you, you have no debt. I, I, I know you do have one uh, complex well, you just well, took. Well, I, I started to say a minute ago, I, I, uh, after uh, a few years, I took about 10 years off. And then uh, within three or four years, I found myself with uh, 60 or 70 units. And then I decided to, that my next goal would be to have 100 units. And then by the time I was in my late 40s or very early 50s, I decided the bank was offering a, a special like 5.2% or something. And I, I went in, I had about 12 or 14 properties that weren't completely paid off. And at that time, I'd already decided to uh, have 100 properties. And then when the bank gave me the five-year the umbrella loan to put all those 12 or 14 properties together, uh, I figured five years later, I would have, uh, I'd be debt free and have 100% yeah. of those paid off. And I had just about 100 units. I had 96 or 97, maybe 98 units. And yeah. so when I reached that, then I started seeing the numbers. So then I went to Des Moines, Iowa, which is about an hour's drive away from Marshalltown, my, my hometown, uh, my adulthood hometown. Uh, but anyway, uh, then I bought 108 Plex. And then all in these last five years, I've bought, uh, wow, hundreds and hundreds of units. And all with all with uh, sweat equity from the beginning, yep. and all from uh, sca scavenged labor, scavenged purchases, uh, scavenged materials. Now you know uh, I, I had the privilege to to read your book, and uh, I, I tell you, I, I got to tell you, when I was reading it, I, I was actually saying, could this be true? Because <laughs> where you came from and where you are now, it's an mm. unbelievable story. And again, so many times people, once they have capital, it's not too difficult to be able to strategically use money to make more money but coming from nothing and being raised in a family where you didn't learn all the financial principles and you had to go mm -hmm. you know basically self-educate it's mm -hmm. such an amazing story mm -hmm. now the book uh, is actually scavenge your way to wealth mm -hmm. uh, tell us a and little bit uh, about about the book the book uh, just uh, starts off um, my dad uh, couldn't work anymore in 1954 uh, he worked for uh, a, a stone, uh, it was called Roy E. Beard Cutstone Company in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, his lungs filled up with stone dust. At that time, nobody wore a mask. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, he had to quit working. He was, he was no longer dependable. He would uh, take a couple of steps. He would, he would collapse. Uh, it couldn't get his breath. And so uh, we just started uh, a, a dump picking circuit. We went to all the city dumps and the county dumps and uh, fished out all the metals, uh, copper, lead, brass, uh, zinc, aluminum, steel, mm. and uh, took them to the salvage yard and uh, got basic, uh, um, uh, you know, we sold it for the whatever money we could to pay our uh, basic bills, uh, electricity, and buy food items and that. Well, you know, reading the book, Steve, uh, I, I don't even know, I mean, I know a lot of people call you like a real estate mogul or this very successful real estate guy, but you know, a lot of the principles that mm -hmm. you use mm -hmm. are really financial principles. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure after reading the book I would really even call you a real estate guy, but almost a financial expert <laughs> yeah. because the techniques that you're using <laughs> are, are a lot of, of techniques that, that yeah. really savvy, and I mean yeah. very educated, yeah. savvy yeah. financial people use. And now, you mm -hmm. built your wealth by transferring a lot of times equity yeah. from one property yeah. to another. Over, over leveraging, leveraging every everything uh, that I could, you know, getting the maximum out of the value that I had to buy the biggest property uh, from uh, cross collateralizing or, or transferring the equity from something small to something as big as I could buy and then uh, remodel, uh, generate more rents and then keep on buying and buying and buying. Well, you know, when you think about the premise of s literally scavenge your way mm -hmm. to wealth, mm -hmm. 
uh, you might think of like, would I want to live in a home like that? Would I want to go in a home where everything was, and, and you kind of envision like this thing that's like, okay, it's a low rent type mm -hmm. deal. Mm -hmm. That's not the case at all. Yeah. Last time we oh. were together, I, I saw yeah. pictures of yeah. a lot of your properties yeah. inside now. And I'll tell you one thing, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the strategies that you use to do this, I think mm -hmm. equally as impressive mm -hmm. is your standard uh, right. of quality okay. because I would be honored to live in yeah. a lot of your, the places that yeah. you're putting out, I mean, they look like Homes Magazine type <laughs> places. Yeah. So we're not well, talking a dilapidated well, thing that's yeah. a low rent. Let me just say this, uh, after I got going, after the first few purchases, I found out how to scavenge brand new materials. There's uh, all kinds of like upper and lower cabinets that are, that are scraped or they're scuffed or they're, they're <coughs> kicked or they're gouged, they're scratched, and you can get the, those for like 50 cents on the dollar. And uh, all you have to do is you know, paint them or you can sand out the, the smudges, sand out the scratches and uh, install them. Nobody knows the difference. Same way with uh, roofing. One time I bought enough uh, uh, asphalt shingles to do three or four roofs. And when they came out of the factory, they looked really neat. But like on one end or the other, it was a little bit too light or a little bit too dark. And so they just sold me a, a ton of them at, at a certain a very low price. We picked all through them and we threw out those that were very obviously you know, uh, too dark or too light on one end and just completely threw those away and then just fished through everything else. And we had, we had three quarters or more of everything I bought wow. was brand new, good materials. And I got them for pennies on the dollar. I've done that with windows. I've done that with doors. Everything. I've done that basically. with carpeting. I've done it with cabinets. I've done it with everything. Wow. And not just picking in the dump, but, but uh, scavenging, like I said, all brand new stuff. Yeah, so it's not dilapidated. Then we're talking new stuff here, and you know yeah. we really appreciate these mm. success principles. Mm. And the and again, we're talking about being able mm. to build an empire from nothing. And uh, we're going to mm. take a quick break. We're going to come back with Steve Ames. We're going to learn more financial mm. tips of how to make something from nothing. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you. We're sitting here with uh, entrepreneur Steve Ames. And Steve, I got to tell you. Uh, such an interesting guy. As I mentioned, we were talking a little bit about your book, um, Scavenging Your Way to Wealth. And it's, it's such an amazing, uh, it's such a great American story because, I mean, we're talking about the premise of coming from nothing. And, uh, you know, we, we mentioned your father would take you to these dump sites, literally. And uh, totally. now you have this empire and you're, you're the envy of many entrepreneurs <laughs> because there's so many entrepreneurs out there where they just get trapped in their business that they, they, they can't take a vacation. They're, they're prisoners of their business. They mm -hmm. go on vacation, they come mm -hmm. back, they're putting out fires. But I know you don't have all of your properties in one location. You have them in numerous different states yes. and you have mm -hmm. it set up now pretty much on autopilot yes, where you can leave the country. I know you're going yes. to Dubai, yes. which I'm trying to work out going with you. <laughs> okay. And uh, mm -hmm. all these things, and, and you can go anywhere and you're completely yeah. mobile. You've yeah. not only set it up to to be on autopilot, but you have this income coming in without, right. without being yeah, there. Yeah, I saw that coming a long time ago. I don't know who it was I talked to, but they uh, left uh, quite an impression with me. They said, D don't, don't find yourself uh, working in a job where you constantly have to get out of bed and go to that job every day or else you, you, uh, you won't be able to feed yourself, you won't be able to pay your bills. You need something that'll go on autopilot. And so I, I thought more and more about the, you know, having a 20-plex or a 50-plex or, or a 100-plex uh, apartment unit, having a full-time on-site manager, having a full-time on-site maintenance person, and uh, I could you know, check in with these yeah. people by phone or by, by internet and never, never really have to be there. Yeah. But that was, uh, that was huge to conquer in my mind because I was born so uh, genetically uh, hands-on. I was so programmed to be so hands-on that I was, it was, I was in my early to mid-50s before I really got it, that I could back let away from a big... And trust somebody else. Yes, that's that exactly right. That's exactly yeah, right. Go. Well, you know, I, I think I, I agree with you. There's so many people that are programmed to, they have to be involved. And it's admirable because they want to be in the trenches. They want but you know what? You can't capture big volume that way. You, and right. then you're tied yeah. like a yeah. prisoner. You yeah. have to be able yeah. to let go. You have to be able to yeah. trust others that they're going to be able to get the job run, done right. And of course, in this economy now, if they're not doing the job right, there's a million other people that are qualified that will do the job right yeah. uh, for the steady income. So it's amazing what yeah. you accomplished. Now, the book, as I mentioned, I had a chance to, to actually go through it and read it. And there's amazing, not only amazing stories, but there's a lot of success principles that if people had nothing and they said, you know what, hard work and sweat 
and, and, and it gr there's a lot of principles people could take and actually create something very substan uh, substantial. What kind of impact do you feel like this book mm -hmm. would have on others? Uh, I know what I well, think it will yeah, have. Well, for one thing, the economy is not so good right now. Um, people can do exactly what we've been talking about here, just the, exactly the same as I've done, I mean, even though I started 35 years ago. Um, and uh, you don't have to go into a bank and say, well, uh, I, I need uh, 20000 40000 uh, to get into this business or that. You can literally start with, with pennies, and that's, that's one of my main messages. You, don't, you really don't have to have tons of savings. You don't. So if there's somebody in our viewing audience right now that's saying, you know what, I know that more millionaires have been created through real estate than anything else. It's a proven fact. I know that I could do this, uh, but I don't have any capital. I don't know how to start. I don't... Do you feel like, realistically, if somebody's out there and they don't have any money, they might be able to put together 500 bucks or 1000 bucks. They yeah. can't come up with a loan. They don't have the yeah. credit to swing it. Yeah. Through tips in your book and through hard work, can yeah. they accomplish, you in could, this day and age, yes, what you accomplish? Yes, you can always find somebody. Let's say you hunt, hunt the community, hunt through the community and find a shack. Um, maybe you find 10 shacks. Well, maybe nine owners of those 10 owners, they want at least 5000 or 10000 down. And, and, and then after that, they want to set you up on payments. If you don't have that kind of cash, they'll say, sorry, pal, uh, you get on down the road because we don't want to deal with it. But there's probably one person out of 10 uh, that, that will say, I'll well, uh, give, give, I'll work something out. Give yeah. me $1,000. Uh, uh, if you get a tenant in there in the next month or so, we'll delay your payments here for a couple of months. I know that'll generate 600 a month. Uh, you give me 300 a month for the next uh, two years, and let's have it appraised at that time, and, and then we'll go from there. There's always somebody ready to do a deal with you. There's always somebody ready to do a yeah. deal. It doesn't matter. They'll just sort of take a liking to you. They'll see something in your personality. They'll, they'll believe you. It might come at a time for them. They just want to get it behind them. Absolutely. And, and so there you are. Well, in a corporate application, I know so many business owners are so frustrated with their business, and mm -hmm. the business might have a lot of assets, but it's technically losing money on payroll, and they mm -hmm. get so frustrated. Mm -hmm. They would say, you know, I just want to put this behind me. I want to walk away from this thing. Mm -hmm. Sign over a liability. Take over the company. I'll walk. Give me a grand or whatever. I, I'm mm -hmm. on out. And, you know, as you mentioned, there, there's a lot of people out there, especially now, mm -hmm. the, that are willing to do things and settle for different terms they might not have done five or ten years ago. Right. And so I, I agree with you. I think that right now there's a great opportunity because of where the economy is that people yeah. are more workable to be able to give people the advantage of yeah. uh, being able to build something like you have right. uh, literally from nothing. Now, I, I believe this book is going to really be embraced and it's oh. going to impact millions and millions of lives. Mm -hmm. Is there a plan for follow-up books? Uh, or? <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. What can I get, Steve? I already read that book. I mean, there's not mouse <laughs> well, I've, 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 actually, good. I've written a, a few pages of the second book, and it's also going to be, we're creating a, a Scavenger Way to Wealth series. And uh, so the first one is a Scavenger Way to Wealth, and then um, a Rags to Riches memoir. The second one is Scavenger Way to Wealth, Shacks on a Shoestring is a subtitle. And the third one will be Scavenger Way to Wealth, and then it'll go on down from there. I figure I can get at least a half a dozen books out of this series. Yeah. And I know, I know you're already a very successful guy. I know, that, I, I know you pretty well, Steve. I know you don't do anything for money. I, I know you have this drive in you to genuinely help people and really af provide affordable housing to right. people. And uh, right. I know with the book series, you wouldn't put those books out there unless you could provide real value Absolutely. that you believe would really Absolutely. help some folks. Absolutely. Because I'm, as you could see, everything that I wrote about, it's 100% the truth. I wasn't um, drawing on anybody else's ideas. E everything is, 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 is uh, what I've d uh, documented. I had those personal experiences. And I plan to do the same. The second book that I've already started, that's called uh, Shacks on a Shoestring. I, I bought the, a shack the other day for ten thousand dollars with a thousand dollars down. So there you go, thousand yeah. yeah. dollars. You're and I'm going to document every stage of um, of the remodeling or the rehabbing, and all with scavenged labor, scavenged materials, and then I scavenged the the purchase also. You go through uh, bankruptcy attorneys, or you go through uh, defaulted right. assets through banks. There's always a, a banker, somebody in, in a Willing bank to. that handles only the defaulted assets. If you've got an account there, if you've got a pretty good credit rating, if you've got uh, maybe a little bit of a connection, uh, you might even ask for, I never asked for a co-signer. I did everything on my own, but some people, it's maybe they have a, a father, mother, aunt, uncle that might co-sign. There's always a way. Always a way. Right? There's always a way. Yeah. And, you know, we appreciate you so much, mm -hmm. Stephen. Mm -hmm. You know, on our show, we try to make one very practical business 
point every single week, every episode, we try to give away one success principle. Uh, but we've been talking about the importance of education. And you know what? A, a, a big part of being a successful uh, entrepreneur is, is risk. You know, a lot of times people are out there and they're looking for that perfect scenario where the stars line up perfectly and you got that zero risk situation where you got this guaranteed win. And you know, that never happens. And if there's no risk, generally there's not much to gain. You don't stand to win very big either if you want that no risk scenario. So as an investor myself, I, I kind of look at it like, like Vegas odds. I try to find like an 80-20 rule. You know, if I, if I see a deal and I'm 80% sure it's likely it's gonna succeed, but I see 20% risk, I'm like you, I'm all in quickly or I'm out. I say, you know what, I'm in, it's 80% likeliness. And the way I look at it, that is sometimes I make bad decisions. Sometimes we slip on, uh, slip on banana pills. We make bad investments. But overall, uh, I'm, I, I don't begrudge those 20% times because, you know, Las Vegas, even when the house loses, the house always wins. And if I didn't have that philosophy of approaching business that way, I, not, I wouldn't have those 20% losses, but I wouldn't have the 80% wins either. And I think you have to be comfortable with pulling the trigger, uh, looking at risk, assessing risk properly. Yeah. And one way you've able, been able to actually minimize risk is by finding materials, lowering your fixed cost right. uh, and minimizing that margin. Another thing too, in my case, I didn't have anything. So, you know, you, you, if, you, if you don't have anything, you risk everything because right. you have yeah. nothing to lose. Exactly, that's a great if point. You, if you don't have anything to you lose, that far you, reach for the, you reach for the stars and that's what I did. Absolutely, that's a great point. There's a saying that says if you shoot for the stars, you might hit an eagle. And when you don't have anything to risk, you gotta jump all in. So if you're out there, if you're thinking about, you know, I'd love to get involved, I'd like to be an entrepreneur, I'd like to do something, but you know what, I don't have any money. Don't use capital or the lack of capital as an excuse. Get involved, pick up Steve's book, uh, scavenge your way to wealth will be out due out uh, by the end of July end of July we'll keep you informed with that and I'll tell you what Steve it's been such a pleasure having you on the show come back would you I sure will you know guys that's our show tonight thank you very much and uh, don't forget to get involved in your local community and be forgiving of others good night everybody thank you